Hello and welcome to Main Street United Methodist Church's online worship service for February 28th. That is the second Sunday in Lent. Let's all prepare our hearts and minds to worship our Lord and Savior. Thank you once again for an opportunity to worship you, not only in this place at this time, but in our own homes. Lord, I pray that you would sanctify our homes as worship space for you. Pour out your Holy Spirit here and into the homes of everyone who is worshiping with us online. Help us all to feel your presence, Lord. Grab us in our spirits and lift our spirits to you. We love you, Lord. Amen. Now let's sing our hymn of praise, Lord of the Dance. It's number 261 in the hymnal.
affirmation of faith is number 881 in the back of the hymnal. This is the Apostles' Creed, our traditional version. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our gospel lesson is from the book of Mark, Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38.
Will you pray with me? Oh, holy Lord. Lord, I thank you for this scripture that you've given us. I thank you for inspiring Mark to write down Peter's words so that we have an account of the things that Jesus said and did. Lord, I pray that you would open our minds to understanding this scripture a little better. And may the meditation of our hearts and the words of our lips always be acceptable to you. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There was once a man who was called the Balloon Man. And he loved his balloons. He really did. He went everywhere with his balloons. When he went out to eat, when he walked down the street, when he slept, he always had his balloons because he just loved them. He particularly loved going to the park or if there was holidays or a fair, and he would go to the fair and have all of his balloons, just thinking this is making the whole world a cheerier place because of his balloons, and he just loved his balloons. Well, um, sometimes people would come up to him and, and thinking, think that he was selling the balloons, and they'd offer to buy them, but oh no, he wasn't going to sell any of his balloons. No, these were his balloons. Well, one day... Um, he signed up for a contest, and he won a, an all-expenses cruise on a cruise liner to the Caribbean. He was so excited, and he packed all of his things, and he got all ready to go, and he brought his balloons with him. He had a little trouble in the taxi getting to the, to the ship to get all the balloons in, but, but he was able to, to get them in with him. And, uh, and when he got up on the deck of the ship and the ship was going off, there were balloons everywhere, and he felt really at home. And, and so he waved at the crowds, and they all waved back, and they were a big celebration. It was wonderful. Well, the steward came to him and said, Here, let me take you to your cabin. And so he, he took him through the, through the ship, and uh, they were going down this hall, and there was this this little tiny door that went into his cabin, and, and he looked at that door, and he looked at his balloons, and he tried to get into his cabin, but he couldn't get all the balloons through the door. And so, uh, so he, he went back up out on the deck and, and saw that there were these lounge chairs up on the deck, and he thought to himself, well, I'll just sleep up here. It'll be okay. And, uh, and then 
he started smelling the really wonderful food that was coming out uh, from the dining room, the dining area. And so he wanted to, to go and eat uh, this wonderful food in the, uh, in the dining area. And when, when, but when he tried to go once again, he couldn't get into the, the dining room with all of his balloons. There just wasn't enough room to get through with all of his balloons. And so he went back out onto the deck and he noticed that there were uh, tables with snacks and cheese and crackers and that sort of thing up on the, on the deck. And he thought, well, I'll just eat these cheese and crackers. It'll be okay. I'll just eat this and sleep out here on the deck at night. And he did that for the first couple of days. And then the steward came to him with an engraved invitation that he, the balloon man, was being invited to the captain's table. And you know, the captain always has the best food, even though there's great food everywhere, the captain's table, what an honor. And he was actually getting tired of the crackers and cheese. And so he thought, I'm gonna get to eat at the captain's table. And that night, when the time came to go to the captain's table, um, he was unable to go in and eat at the captain's table because he couldn't get through the door with all of his balloons. He could try, but he was sure that he might pop one if that happened. If, if he was to try to get through all these balloons through, he might pop one. And so he, he, he was standing there looking in and he could smell, he could smell how wonderful that food tasted. Or just imagine how it tasted, but he could smell it. It smelled so good. And he was so hungry. And he knew the only way he could get in and eat at the captain's table was if he let go of the balloons. But he's had these balloons for a long time. And he loved the balloons. He takes them everywhere. But slowly, he opened up his fingers. And it was hard because his fingers were cramping a bit. And he opened up his fingers and let the balloons go. And then he went into the captain's table to eat. In our scripture verses this morning, Jesus was on his way to the cross. And he knew what was going to await him there. And he wanted his disciples to be prepared for what was coming. So he began teaching them about what was going to happen. Uh, verses 31 and the first part of verse 32, he says he, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. He knew what was coming, the betrayal, the pain, the suffering, Jesus loved us so much that he went anyway so that we could be saved from our sins and be restored to a right relationship with God. Peter, on the other hand, he had great expectations about what was going to happen when Jesus returned to Jerusalem. He knew that it was the Passover and that Jews from all over the known world would be gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover. And Peter must have expected that Jesus was going to announce his kingship and that the Jewish people would rise up in rebellion and throw off the yoke of this Roman government that was, had conquered them. I mean, that's what the Messiah was supposed to do. Or so they thought. I imagine it was hard for their disciples, for the disciples to wrap their minds around what Jesus was saying. And I, I could just imagine them whispering to, to each other, did you hear what he said? Oh, he must be speaking in parables. I wonder what he really means. 
Well, Jesus told his disciples that he had to undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and that he would be killed and after three days rise again. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Now, when Jesus was in the desert and tempted by Satan, one of the major temptations was for power. And the devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms on the earth and told, told Jesus that all of that power could be his if he would only bow down and worship him. Well, of course, Jesus resist, resisted that temptation. And in today's scripture, Peter was being the devil's advocate by tempting Jesus again with political power. Verse 33 reads, But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And just like the balloon man and his balloons, it must have been very hard for Jesus' disciples to let go of their human expectations. Jesus was turning their world upside down. They thought that he was going to come and save them from the, the Roman government. But Jesus came to save them from their sins. Human expectations rarely coincide with divine direction. And only when we set our minds on divine things do our human expectations begin to match up with God's expectations for us. Proverbs 19.21 reads, The human mind may devise many plans, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will be established. Oh, we can come up with all kinds of human plans, but if they do not match up with the Lord's purposes, then they are all just chasing after the wind. In verse 34, Jesus began speaking to the entire crowd, and he said, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now to us, the cross is the place where Jesus paid the price for our sin so that we could be washed clean in his blood. And the cross is for us is a symbol of Jesus' love, his sacrificial love that paved the way for our salvation. And so today we will proudly display a cross. But that's all hindsight. In Jesus' day, the cross, well, that was a form of execution that was the most painful and degrading execution that the human mind had devised. It was a, a symbol of shame and suffering in the worst way that people could think of. It was as though Jesus was saying, if you want to follow me to Jerusalem, do not think that you are following me to fame and glory. You follow me to Jerusalem, you're going to be following me into shame and suffering. Take up your cross. Follow me. So once again, Jesus was turning their world upside down. And then he said in verse 35, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. He was turning their world upside down. A, a life of sin isn't life. A life of sin is death. Hanging on to a life of sin is hanging on to death. And people who are hanging on to their life of sin, they don't know what real life is. But just like the balloon man, as long as people hang on to their sins, they will never get into the heavenly banquet. They'll never know the true strength and joy 
that is a life in Jesus Christ. Those who hang on to their life of sin have already lost their life. But those who lose their old life of sin for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the good news, they will save their lives. Good news is all about salvation and the forgiveness of sins. It's about being restored to that right relationship with the, our Creator through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. In verse 36, Jesus said, For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? That is, what will it profit them to gain worldly things and then lose their soul? In John Eldridge's book, uh, Wild at Heart, he gives a testimony about how he, he had this job that he was doing, and he was very good at it, and he was making good money at that job. But he really believed God was calling him to switch careers from the, the job that he had to a job that would really help other people. It would mean uncertainty. It would mean financial hardship, or at least at first. It would mean that he'd have to go back to college and, and learn this new career. And he really felt God was leading him to, to become a counselor and help people. And when all that happened, as he was just deciding that he was going to uh, leave his lucrative job, the job that he had, that would be security. He was going to leave that job and step out into the unknown uh, in, in what he believed God was leading him to do. He got a call from his company and they wanted to give him a promotion to the top of the, top of the heap. So he could either step out in faith into a, a world of uncertainty and financial hardship or he could take this promotion and be uh, economically secure. But he was afraid that if he took that promotion, that a little something inside would die. God had really given him a passion for this new career. He could accept the promotion but lose his soul to a job he didn't really want to do anymore. I'm not saying that he would have lost his salvation, but he would have lost his spiritual drive, his passion. I wonder how many people end up in a job that they hate because of financial security, and then a little something dies inside as a result. What will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Verse 37, Jesus said, Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Well, the fact is, there is nothing we can give in return for life. There's nothing we can give for our lives, but there is something that Jesus could give the wages of sin is death. But Jesus paid that price on the cross so that we could live. In verse 38, Jesus said, Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus Christ invites you to let go of those sins that you are clinging to so closely. Receive the forgiveness of sins and receive a true abundant life in Christ Jesus. And Jesus will turn your world upside down. Jesus will turn your world upside down. And when you get there, you will realize that you are finally right side up. Praise be to God. Now let us all join together in our hymn of fellowship, number 528, 
nearer my God to thee. I would like to thank everyone for continuing to give your tithes and offerings to God through this church. The ministries of this church continue on even in the midst of this pandemic. 
And I would like to say a prayer over all the tithes and offerings that we have received. Let us pray. Lord God, I pray you would bless all these gifts and bless the givers. I thank you for the leadership of the church and for giving them the, the knowledge and the skill to use these funds and these resources wisely. Lord, everything that we have has come from you. You have given all of us stewardship over a portion of your creation. Teach us how to be better stewards of what you've given us, Lord. Teach us how to learn and grow and build your kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Father God. Lord, you know that, that we are going through a difficult time because of this pandemic. I thank you for the glimmer of hope that you give us that this uh, will end. I thank you for the researchers and the doctors and the nurses that have been able to develop a vaccine for this virus. I pray that you would um, allow efficient distribution of the vaccine to all the people. Lord, I know that there are, there are many people who are grieving the loss of loved ones. And so I pray that you would pour out your comfort on all those who are grieving. I know there are many people who are feeling distressed and I pray you would comfort them also. Lord, open our eyes to seeing your hand around us, to open our eyes to the blessings. And let those blessings uh, be the light that we can follow to walk through the dark times into something better. Lord, I pray you'd pour out your healing on all those who are suffering from cancer. Heal them, Lord. I pray you would heal all those who have contracted the coronavirus. I pray that you would heal everyone who is sick. And if anyone is in pain, Lord, give them relief of that pain. And give us all hope. Hope for a better day. I ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us all join together in our hymn of commitment, Where He Leads Me, number 338.
And now may our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, pour out his blessings upon you all so that you may walk a little closer to God every day. God bless you. Amen. Thank you.